thanks so much for joining Contagion. Appreciate having you here. It's my pleasure. So just to start off, I always like to pe ask people their background in their own words, and uh, I'll just open the floor to you for that. Sure. So my name is Denise Basso. I'm a primary care physician, and I'm the CEO of Walters Clor Clinical Effectiveness. Uh, it's a lot of words. Our, our uh, business is focused on providing solutions that help reduce unwanted variability in care by providing clinical decision support, drug information, and tools that help engage patients in their care. Great, great. And so what was that project like before the outbreak and how has it sort of changed that? Yeah, um, I, it's, it's uh, more than a project. Um, our, uh, the, the largest part of our solution, uh, which is up to date, our clinical decision support uh, product has been around for more than 25 years, actually. Um, it was started by a nephrologist named Bud Rose, who was interested in helping clinicians answer clinical questions that come up every day at the point of care and answering those in an evidence-based way. And over the last 25 plus years, we've uh, expanded that to include all of uh, medicine and we're now used by about 2 million uh, clinicians around the world. So you can think of it as like a, a, a Google for doctors, um, only better uh, and, uh, and evidence-based. And um, that uh, up-to-date, even before COVID-19 was uh, typically accessed more than a million times a day uh, around the world to answer those clinical questions. And we have data to suggest that about 30% of the time when clinicians access up to date, they're actually changing a clinical decision. So before anybody knew what COVID-19 was, um, you can think of, of us as impacting, you know, somewhere around 300,000 clinical decisions a day uh, around the world. Um, so it's, it's interesting because in, in a way, um, we were uh, extremely prepared for, for something like, like COVID-19 because what our practice is um, for, for all these years has been to try to take this vast medical literature and synthesize it into something that clinicians can access quickly at the point of care, that they can trust, and that they can use to help them make decisions. So if you think about what happened with COVID, those things were never more needed than, than after um, the pandemic started um, you know, spreading around the world. And with, with that spread, there's been this urgency on the part of researchers to publish information, but that also, and that's understandable, but that also introduces certain contradictions with the desire to have accurate science. And so I'm curious what, regardless of the situation, are the standards for um, empirical basis? Because you've talked a bit about this, this isn't just anybody's stories this is this is peer reviewed type of evidence based stuff so what 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 were kind of the standards before um and how do you apply those then to a situation in which so much of what we're learning is coming out through these like preprints and all of that yeah it's a great question so um we have for many years really tried to perfect to the degree we can uh an editorial process that makes sure that we are getting things as right as, as we can get them. And uh, we, we actually, um, it's really a mission and it's a responsibility of ours to get that right because we know that clinicians are not only accessing our content, but they're actually changing their decisions, impacting patient care based on our content. So we feel a, a huge responsibility to make sure that we get these things right. So we've established an editorial process that I think is pretty unique. Uh, we work with around 6,000 experts around the world, so clinical experts around the world. We have uh, our own internal clinical experts as well as experts in um, clinical epidemiology or evidence-based medicine. And we read the world's literature. And um, that, that's, you know, even in the best of circumstances, 
it's nearly impossible for physicians to keep up with the medical literature. And even if they can keep up with the medical literature, to be able to understand what all of that literature means, not just a single study, but how all of these studies relate together and, and what should they actually do. And so we have, uh, again, taken um, this process to an extreme of combining the best ex expertise with the best evidence and really giving every clinician in the world access to the best expertise in the world. Um, and so when, um, you know, that, that was in a normal state. Um, to give you a picture of how the world has changed a bit since COVID-19, uh, at the end of January of uh, 2020, there were about 50 studies published on, uh, on coronavirus, most of them coming out of China, which makes a lot of sense. By the end of April, that number was about 7,000. And as you have articulated, about half of those actually were uh, coming out in the pre-publication literature. And that's even in addition to all of the guidelines and additional sorts of sources of information. I can remember uh, in early February watching um, videos of physicians in, um, in Italy and some of what they were experiencing and, and what they were recommending. So, um, you know, forget even the, the publication or publications of the pre-publication literature. There was all of this other uh, information. Um, you know, academic centers were putting out their own guidelines as, as they were beginning to see more and more of these cases. And so what we've really uh, tried to do and what our expertise is, is in looking, first of all, we've got the, the people and the experts and, and the bandwidth to actually read all of that. Um, and so we do that very well. And then we tried to disambiguate all of that information and, um, and uh, do it in a way that, uh, again, meets the quality standards that we've always had, but also have to do it in, in real time. You know, if you think about it, every day there is a, a new question being asked and every day the answer to that question is new. <laughs> and that's a really, you know, in the you know, 25 years I've been doing this business, that is a wholly unique situation. So we've had to put, uh, just as journals have put their peer review process uh, you know, on an accelerated pace, we've put our own process on an accelerated pace. And again, just to throw out a few more numbers, we've now published about 40, we call them topic reviews, so topics on, um, on COVID-19. And you can think of a topic as everything from routine care of those patients, to respiratory care, to Kawasaki, to the new Kawasaki syndrome, to should you put patients on blood thinners, um, should you put them in a prone position when they're on a ventilator, all of those questions that, that um, we, we've had to address. And all of those topics together have been updated more than 300 times in the last two months. So it just gives you a, a feeling for the scale of information that we ourselves have had to uh, have had to synthesize and, and dis disambiguate and, and not just tell these clinicians what the information is, but really try to, to um, make specific recommendations so that they can care for these patients. Right, to actually be able to draw something from this huge body of literature is, is important, I, I agree. And, and so are there any examples of maybe where we've been hasty with the way we've interpreted, you know, not we, the royal we, you know, the, the, the scientific community where, where excitement has kind of come out of some of these pre-clinical results and, and it's caused uh, lack of caution or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to be careful because I think the, the, um, the, the pre-clinical or pre-publication, um, you know, sort of literature is actually important. It's what allowed us to quickly understand what the, the genome was. Of, yeah, it's not um, black and white, absolutely. Know, and, yeah, and so, so there's, there's, you know, definitely a, a place for that. But, you know, you think about, I mean, the, the classic example would be hydroxychloroquine, so the anti-malarial drug um, that uh, received a lot of press um, some early studies suggested it, it might be effective. Some later studies suggesting, well, maybe not so much. Um, and, you know, and, and there's still a lot of, um, you know, there's still some ambiguity there. And that's one of those cases where, um, you know, it, it, it's difficult, but we have to, again, um, take the evidence that's available, 
but also apply a little bit of um, you know, knowledge of how to interpret those data as well as a little bit of the, the expertise in general and, um, and help clinicians understand what to do, but not kind of do that in, in such a hasty way that, that, that we make the wrong conclusion. So that's a pretty classic one that I think has, um, you know, we, we've seen quite a, a bit of evolution. Um, even the antiviral drug um, remdesivir which um, you know the the early studies um, were all case studies um, you know suggested a, a pretty massive effect when the the first randomized controlled trial um, it was stopped early and published early um, you know even that one it showed an impact but we had to be very careful and really just really look into the data and understand what happened so we could best advise um, which patients should use that drug and, uh, and the likely impact, um, not, you know, not only which patients actually, but when in the course of their illness, um, what, is it most potentially most effective? Um, so these are the sorts of details that you don't get from just the headlines of a study that you really have to look in, into it to, um, to understand and to, to draw reasonable conclusions. Right. I mean, even with remdesivir, absolutely. And uh, that's the thing about even hydroxychloroquine is that new information is going to come to light. We don't have the final say on it. And people are just trying to interpret based on the, the stuff we have now. And so it's, it's certainly helpful to have uh, that being interpreted on the fly. So is there any other aspect of the platform that you wanted to highlight or something about the general situation we're in that, that strikes you? Yeah, I think, you know, a couple of things. So, um, so first I, um, you know, I think the, one of the really interesting uh, pieces of this pandemic and, and kind of watching how care is being practiced and just watching how physicians are working so hard to do the best they can um, for patients is it's a reminder of what a cohesive community um, physicians are around the world. Um, and so it's been very interesting to watch, I think, the exchange of information between physicians. And we've tried to because we probably have the largest community of physicians in the world, um, we've tried to facilitate that exchange um, in some ways. So um, we've uh, launched, a, you know, we'll call it a Q&A feature, but allowing physicians to, to ask um, very specific questions that perhaps we haven't answered so that we can make sure that we're getting all of those answers out, not only to them, but to the rest of their colleagues who most certainly need it. And also just really encouraging um, feedback because although we have a, an editorial process that, that we think is quite good, we really view that the whole world is our, our peer review. When you have a community of 2 million physicians, um, you learn a lot about what's going on in, in the real world because the medical literature doesn't always replicate the real world. Um, and so I think the, just the community aspect of this um, ha has been very interesting. I think the, the other um, uh, thing that I would highlight is I mentioned at the beginning that um, you know, we have other products within our portfolio and one of them um, is a, a patient engagement product that we, we call Emmy. And, um, and not forgetting the patient side of this and the need for patients to be educated in, in every aspect from how they um, protect their families if, they, if they've had an exposure, when to seek help, if they've already had uh, the virus or been in the hospital, what things are important when they, they go home to recover. And if you think about how inundated our healthcare system has been the you know, physicians and, and nurses and, and all the other allied health professionals, having um, technology that can help outreach to, to patients has, has actually been, uh, been very critical. Um, and that also has extended to things like, um, you know, like telehealth where, you know, simple things about how to, to come prepared for a telehealth visit. So I, I, I think it's important that, you know, we're, we've spent a lot of time focusing on the literature and, and on getting the right information into the hands of clinicians, but also getting that information and the right information into the hands of patients um, 
it's it's important under any circumstances but again that's been i think highlighted for me very well during the the pandemic i mean yeah especially with the strain that the healthcare system is under i mean that has huge clinical consequences so that that's a great thing to point out um something i've been trying to do at the end of these at the end of these interviews because of how strange i suppose the times we're living in i just ask people if they have a positive story about what's been going on the past few months, a patient interaction or a interaction with a colleague that um, gave you a little hope or anything like that. But, you know, it's a bit of a silly question. So if you want to just call it there, that's fine. But I thought I'd open it to you. Um, so I, I, well, this is going to... Something you're proud um, of, even, I think is a great prompt for that, too. Yeah, well, I think this is going to sound... Um, a little bit strange because you asked for something positive, but um, but but bear with me. <laughs> um, so we, um, I, I mentioned earlier, the founder of Up to Date, Bud Rose, and um, he actually passed away of COVID nineteen last month, and um, it was obviously a um, a very sad time for all of us. So why do I take something positive out of that? Um, we um, we decided to put a, a, a tribute up. Um, to him on our uh, website and had um, almost 3,000 responses to that tribute just talking about what a difference uh, up to date and um, in particular just how important it is to have um, this type of information um, in the hands of clinicians to help them do their jobs better and, and just so many stories that that came out of that that um, took something that was um, devastating and sad and, um, and really, um, you know, shown a positive light on the impact that, um, that individuals have and that, you know, mission driven organizations can have. So, um, uh, so that, that's something that was, um, you know, actually directly related to the, the pandemic, but, um, you know, had a, you know, a, a broader reach than just the pandemic.